Hi, and welcome to CVI 2020. My name is Ahmed Alaiti. I am an interventional cardiologist at North Texas VA Healthcare System, UT Southwestern Dallas, Texas. I'll be talking to you today about a very interesting case that happened to me uh, recently uh, about uh, a stuck uh, OCT catheter in uh, the uh, coronary artery. This is a case of 75 year old male with complex past medical history, including end stage renal disease on peritoneal dialysis, a significant history of peripheral artery disease with lower extremity bypass, uh, hypertension, diabetes, uh, presented with chest pain and STEMI uh, with uh, ischemic uh, EKG changes in the uh, inferior lateral uh, leads. His uh, left angiogram uh, showed a mid LAD CTO with left to left collateral, uh, distal uh, left main uh, lesion that did not seem to be uh, critical, uh, and uh, calcified significant osteocircumflex uh, disease. RCA angiogram showed severe stenosis in the mid-segment with a filling defect that could represent uh, a thrombus uh, formation, uh, as shown here uh, in the still images uh, with the uh, white uh, arrow. Uh, there was also distal RCA osteal right PDA severe stenosis as indicated here by the yellow uh, arrow. Giving the clinical presentation and the finding on angiogram, uh, we felt that the RCA is potentially the culprit, uh, so we decided to proceed with an intravascular imaging guided PCI of the RCA uh, through femoral approach, uh, with the guide choice being initially 3D right guide that was changed to an uh, AL1 guide, uh, six fringe, uh, at some point during the procedure for additional support. Uh, as you can see here, uh, this not, was not a straightforward case uh, for many reasons that we're going to discuss in the following slides. Uh, but just to uh, give you a flavor of the complexity of uh, the case and the challenges that we encountered, uh, it was a long case with 76 minutes of fluid, 104 uh, images uh, that were stored. Uh, the initial wiring uh, of the proximal lesion was challenging. Uh, and there was also difficulty in wiring the right PDA uh, that eventually uh, was successfully wired using polymer jacketed wire with a microcatheter support. As was shown on the previous angiogram, uh, there was diffuse calcification of the RCA and the differential diagnosis for the uh, filling defect in the mid RCA uh, could be uh, thrombus uh, formation uh, on one hand uh, on the other hand, it could be a significant, uh, severe protruding calcification. And the differentiation between these two entities uh, is very essential uh, in terms of uh, procedure planning and approach. Uh, we uh, therefore uh, proceeded with uh, OCT that showed uh, mostly a thrombus, uh, organized thrombus uh, formation on the calcium node. Uh, we therefore proceeded with aspiration thrombectomy uh, using penumbra catheter, but without much yield, mostly due to, due to the fact that we could not pass the uh, catheter beyond uh, the lesion. Uh, as you can uh, see here on the, on the image, uh, the uh, wire started coming back and the guide uh, started coming back as well. And we eventually, uh, despite multiple attempts, uh, we just lost a wire position and guide and we had to change to AL1. Based on the data from uh, intervascular imaging, we decided to proceed with PCI uh, using AL1 guide and guide extension for additional support. Uh, we pre-dilated the 3.5 and 4.0 NC balloons uh, with good expansion, uh, followed by stenting using drug eluting stent, uh, 4.0 by 23, uh, post-dilated with 4.0 and 4.5 uh, millimeter NC balloons uh, with good expansion. We decided to proceed with the PCI of the more proximal lesion first, giving the difficulty in delivering equipment to the distal vessel. Uh, we therefore used a uh, guide extension uh, that was advanced to the uh, mid distal uh, RCA and then proceeded with the PCI of the distal RCA uh, into the right PDA uh, using provisional approach. Uh, the lesion was pre-dilated, uh, stented, and post-dilated uh, using the equipment shown on this list. 
uh, with a good expansion. OCT showed a very good stent uh, expansion and opposition without edge dissection. Uh, we noted the T1 flow in the right uh, PLV, as shown here in uh, arrows, uh, white arrows. Uh, so we immediately planned to rescue the right PLV branch. However, and in this aspect, we noted the issue of uh, distal tip of OCT catheter being very close to the actual tip of the uh, wire, uh, as shown on the uh, this uh, image uh, with the red arrow. We have to pause here for a few moments to understand the OCT catheter and to uh, better understand what could have happened during the procedure. Uh, the catheter has a short monorail and is uh, prone to kinking in that segment, uh, as shown here in the red box. The catheter itself is 2.7 flinch with a usable length of 135 cm. It has uh, rapid exchange ports, as I showed you in the previous slide. It fits 014 guide wire, and it can go through 6 to 7 flinch catheter. It has three radio opaque markers, uh, with the second uh, marker being where the actual lens is. And it's usually about 25 millimeters from the actual tip of the uh, catheter. So back to our patient, uh, you can see the guide uh, being the most proximal catheter and then the guide liner in the mid-distal RCA, and then the OCT catheter in the distal RCA into the PDA, with the guide wire being in the PDA. You can see the three radio-opaque markers, uh, numbered 1, 2, 3, from distal to proximal. Uh, the distal marker is about 4 mm from the actual tip. The uh, middle marker, uh, where the actual lens is at, is about 20 mm from the first marker, and that put it at about 25 millimeters from the actual tip of the catheter. Uh, and then the uh, third marker is the most proximal one, is about 50 millimeters from the second marker. And that's usually is the pullback length. Uh, so as you can see here, in order to image the stent uh, in the PDA, I have to place the second marker distal to the stent in order to be able to see the distal edge. And then I should have uh, 25 millimeter, uh, more than 25 millimeter of wire uh, into the vessel in order to avoid the catheter exiting the wire. Uh, as you can see here, I don't believe that the catheter exited the wire at this point, but uh, it did probably at a later stage during the procedure. Uh, as I will show you in the next slide. So this relationship of these markers is very essential uh, to uh, understand for people who use uh, OCT catheter and in fact for any catheter that we use we should be very familiar with the uh, distances and length of these uh, uh, radio opaque markers from the actual tip of the uh, catheter. So what happened next? Uh, I don't have images saved of uh, all the details of what happened between the previous image and the following image that I'm going to show you but uh, I believe mostly what happened was that the actual tip of the catheter was very close to the uh, tip of the wire as I showed you. And the wire might have came back a little bit uh, in a way uh, into the catheter uh, and then it got stuck and tapped uh, with the OCT catheter together. Uh, so I could not pull the wire, I could not uh, pull the OCT catheter back and I could not adjust the wire position anymore. Uh, so I tried to uh, pull back uh, both of them as a unit, one unit into the mid RCA, uh, and then the OCT catheter itself got zapped on the Gizella, and then when we tried to pull everything together, uh, they all appeared to be tapped, and we couldn't tell exactly which part of these equipment was tapped in the vessel, uh, so we decided just to remove all the equipment, including the uh, guide uh, and the wire, uh, to avoid any uh, additional problem. Uh, however, uh, everything came out, but the wire seemed to be uh, tapped in the vessel. So what happened next is that the uh, only thing left in the body was the uh, tapped uh, 014 wire inside the RCA. All the equipment came out except the wire and except the six inch uh, short sheath in the groin. You can see the wire here in the uh, descending aorta in the arch and in the ascending aorta, 
it's hard to see inside the vessel except the uh, radio opaque uh, segment uh, and you can see the distal uh, uh, tip of the radio opaque uh, segment of the wire being the proximal one in this image uh, and uh, you can see a uh, little bit hint of uh, unraveled wire inside the RCA. So we immediately realized that this is even a bigger problem than what we thought initially it is. We paused for a few moments to uh, think about our options before we uh, do something that can potentially make things even worse. Uh, so at this point, we only have a um, regular uh, 014 wire tapped in the coronary inside the body, and we had the short sheath. Uh, the wire is not uh, exchange length, uh, and it's just regular 190 centimeter wire. Uh, we decided to put an additional 014 wire inside the sheath into the uh, uh, descending aorta. And we used both wires to change the sheath into long uh, 90 centimeter six plane sheath, and we advanced it as close as possible to the uh, coronary ostium. Uh, we then tapped uh, the wire that was tapped in the coronary artery. We tapped it with a tapping balloon inside the sheath. And then we advanced a uh, uh, microcatheter fine cross into the RCA. We advanced the microcatheter over the wires as far as we could uh, safely do. And then we pulled both the wire and the microcatheter together into the long sheath uh, successfully and without any uh, segment of the wire left over. Out of many, many OCT cases we've done, this is the only case that I could possibly remember where the OCT catheter got stuck inside the coronary artery over the wire. And this highlights the importance of paying attention to the uh, actual uh, measurements and the uh, distances between the radio opaque markers and the relationship to the distal, the actual tip of the catheter. Uh, and to always, as much as possible, try to keep the distal marker uh, uh, over the wire and proximal to the radio opaque portion of the wire to avoid any uh, similar potential uh, complication in the future. Uh, we still had to deal with the uh, GL uh, right PLV and uh, we reviewed the uh, images that were stored and we realized that the uh, issues with that branch um, happened early on during the case after thrombectomy and during also stenting, we noted that there was already distant embolization in the vessel. As you can notice on the left side of the screen, uh, the, uh, there was distal embolization uh, in the PLV branch that uh, probably happened early on during the procedure, as well as it looks like there was a thrombus or a dissection or both in the uh, proximal uh, segment of the PLV branch. Uh, we spent a significant amount of time uh, working on uh, optimizing and rescuing this branch. We did a uh, TM protrusion stenting technique uh, with two overlapping stents in the osteal and proximal uh, PLV branch. However, we were unable to uh, rescue the distal uh, PLV and despite multiple attempts. At that time, the patient was uh, free of chest pain, hemodynamically stable, so we aborted the procedure. The patient had a follow-up angiogram at a different time and day, and uh, it showed patent stents uh, and residual uh, distal cutoff of the uh, PLV branch. So the take-home messages from the case, uh, be always familiar with the equipment that you use, uh, whether it's microcatheter or imaging catheter, uh, the size, the length, the radio opaque markers, uh, especially the distal one, uh, and the distance between the distal radio opaque marker and the actual tip of the catheter because they are uh, not always the same. Uh, pay close attention to each equipment position, especially during long cases where operator fatigue can happen. Uh, always uh, stop and take a deep breath when you encounter a complication. Uh, even a few seconds can make a huge difference. Uh, you have to Consider your, your bailout options and not always jump to one quick decision without thinking about the consequences because you can potentially make things uh, worse. Uh, you have to be versatile in troubleshooting uh, technical issues and the best way is to learn from other people's mistakes. Thank you very much and have a great day.